Hey guys, thank you for being here. Sherry, good to see you. Lady Luck, good to see you. Glad you're here. Banjo Lady, Radio Gods is in the house. Good to see you guys. I thought we would kind of stick with our theme of bringing out some cold cases. I know that we covered the one for Nellie Hubbard a few days ago, and now we have one that hits a little bit closer to home to me because this one is coming out of Nashville, Tennessee. And I do remember this being on the news when she went missing. This is, let me find the picture of her here for you guys. Where did it go? I got it here. I know it is. This is Tabitha Tudors. Tabitha Danielle Tudors. She was 13 years old. Whenever she left on the morning of April 29th of 2003 to walk to her bus stop, which was a block away from her house, and she never made it. She never made it to the bus stop. She did not make it to school that day, and she has not been seen since. We are coming up on, like I said, April 29th will be 20 years that she has been missing. There have been leads over the years, but so far, none of those have panned out. The last leads they had in her case has been about two years ago. They did go out and search a property in a neighboring county based off some tips that they had got, but nothing in that investigation panned out. They are pretty much back to square one as to what happened to her and where she could have went. There's been multiple theories as to what could have happened to her. Some people believe that she could, in fact, still be out there somewhere that she could be alive. They believe that maybe possibly she was abducted and trafficked and that she could just be out there somewhere. And maybe at this point doesn't even remember where she came from or who she is. I'm not really sure what led the investigation to that conclusion. There were actually detectives that were working that theory, like I said, as of two years ago. I don't know what led them to that conclusion that she could possibly still be out there, but we always have to hold out that hope. And I know that her family is not giving up hope of finding her either. They continue to keep her flyers out. They they actually have a banner for her that is on their front hanging on their front porch and it has been there since right after she went missing and it is still there now they are hoping that maybe one day by some miracle she will just walk back up and be like hey look here i am i'm back that would be the absolute best miracle that we could hope for but I don't know at this point, like I said, it's been 20 years and there's been very little information as of recent about what has happened to her. I do have a really good video put together if I can figure out how to hang on. Where did my buttons go? Hold on. This back of this thing is, there it is. They need to quit changing things. They, they keep moving stuff around. They're confusing me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> But the, here is a, it's a pretty lengthy video, so what I'm going to do is probably just let a lot of it play through. And just if we have any questions, anything of that nature, I will stop it and I'll try to answer what I can for you. Like I said, I mean, I pretty much have been following this from when it, whenever it happened. I remember it being in all over our local news. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Welcome. Oh, Nightbot is working. That's good. Okay. So let's jump into this video. Back in 2003, Tabitha was 13 when she was walking to her bus stop in East Nashville only to vanish and never be heard from again. It's the morning of April 29, 2003 in East Nashville, Tennessee. 13-year-old 7th grader Tabitha Tudors is preparing for the school day. 
she was a good student. She made straight A's. I would help her with her math homework. When I was at school, I was pretty good at math. She was better at math than me, so I sent her to him. Tabitha had a good relationship with her dad. Tabitha is by far the youngest of three siblings. Her brother Kevin is 25, and her sister Jamie is 21. Yeah. My wife was about to hit 30. She wanted another job, so we, we had another. She was a little spoiled. She was our last child, so we spoiled her. Tabitha was always the entertainer, I think, when she was a younger baby. She would always have this, like, little funny face that she would make, and she would, like, breathe in and out, and, of course, it got the entire room laughing. One, two. Like, hide and go seek, or read joke books, constant laughing, and we'd have fights, too. <laughs> but, yeah, she wanted to be just like that. A tight-knit family, the tutors make it a priority to spend their free time together. Tabitha loved going to the racetrack. Every Saturday, we would not miss a race. Tabitha is especially close to her mom. Tabitha wasn't like a leech. My car we couldn't even roll out of the driveway without her wanting to be in. So she went everywhere as I went. She was a cut-up. Always cutting up, joking. She got that from her daddy. It wasn't for me. She'd get in the car and she'd be singing to the music. She likes singing. Yeah. Tabitha is an enthusiastic member of the choir at the Tudors Family Church. She said she was going to be a singer. Whatever my wife was doing, Tabitha would come in and, and do it. And then my wife even taught Tabitha how to make homemade biscuits. <laughs> and, uh, Tabitha fixed them for us one time and we ate them. That was, that was real good. Homemade biscuits. <laughs> According to the Tudors, their hometown of East Nashville is an up-and-coming neighborhood with a few rough edges. In 2003, East Nashville was not the place that you really wanted to call home. Oh, uh, yeah, that is definitely true. I don't know about that neighborhood now. I do know that back in the early 2000s, it was considered a rough neighborhood. There was a lot of, like, drug activity, a lot of you know, crimes that were committed in that neighborhood. I do believe from everything I have seen as far as news-wise, they, they have kind of cleaned it up quite a bit over the years. But back whenever Tabitha went missing, it was a bit of a rough neighborhood. And I don't know if that played any role in her disappearance whatsoever. I I really don't know. but. It, I mean, to me, I think it's possible that it could have possibly somebody that, you know, seen her in the neighborhood, somebody that knew her, maybe, could have taken her. I don't, I don't really, you know, have any evidence of that, but it's definitely a possibility in my opinion. But for me, I grew up here. I've always felt safe here. There's loud music in people's cars when they, they drive down the road, break-ins. But for us, we never had any issues. We've lived here 30 years, and we never had no trouble. I mean, nobody ever bothered us. We don't never bother nobody else. Nonetheless, the tutors worry about their youngest child's safety. I think my parents were more protective of her. She was the baby, their last one, um, up. Every night, Tabitha sleeps on the floor in her parents' bedroom. She'll start out in her bed, and then when I wake up in the mornings to go to work, she's at the foot of my bed. And I asked her one time, I said, why do you do that? And she said, because I want to be close to you. So I never stopped her. The morning of April 29th begins like any other morning for the Tudors family. Tabitha's mother gets up for work early while her daughter is still sleeping. I worked with Metro Schools in the cafeteria. I got up at five. I got ready for work. She was laying at the foot of my bed and then I stepped over her 
Thank you for being here. Ready for work. And it's seven o'clock. I woke Tabitha up and told her, uh, "Get on up, baby. So you get ready for school." Some morning she would eat breakfast here, and then if she has homework that she didn't finish, yeah. she would do it that morning before she left. Tabitha was in good spirits after getting her school report card the previous day. It had all A's on it. She was excited about it. I was proud of her. Her father, Bo, heads to work. She was definitely very close to her mother. Her, her and her mother had a very, very close bond. They, you know, done a lot of activities together, you know, from, you know, teaching her how to cook to running errands, all, you know, all things that mothers and daughters would be doing, you know, as a group, you know, close together. And Tabitha was not, from everything I have read and heard, Tabitha was not the child that was, you know, causing problems. She was not unhappy in her home. There was no reason for her to run away. Uh, she was 13. She was 13 years old. So from, from everything I have seen, there there's no, there's no indication that she would have willingly walked away from her home or her family at all. She loved going to school, so, so I mean, it wasn't like she was going to ditch school and then maybe something happened to her. She, she just was not that child at all. Oh, somebody ain't getting enough love from their mommy. Would you look? Bye. I said, I love you. She said, I love you too, daddy. I said, well, I'm leaving. And I left. At 7.50 a.m., Tabitha heads out the door. Her bus stop is one block away at Boscobel Street and 14th Street. And I told her, you know, don't leave the house until like 10 to 8 because the bus run at 8. I said, they'll give you five minutes to walk up the hill and five minutes to wait on that bus. It should be about 33 now. Tabitha's mother has told her that if there are no other children at her bus stop at 14th Street in Boscobel, she should walk down one more block to 15th Street. Four kids will be waiting. Yeah. I've always told her you don't sit up there on that wall by yourself to go down. Yeah, see that's well that's the thing. Yeah, one one block away. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty much if you if you look at it on the Google map, it is to the end of her street and down the next one, and it's right there at the corner. So it's like the opposite corner of where her house is. It's behind it down the corner. And and that's the thing. They they always had, you know, that safety plan. If there's nobody at the first bus stop, cross over and go to the next bus stop. So, you know, Tabitha, you know, she knew that from, from a very early age, you know, she had been walking to the bus stop by herself most mornings because both of her parents had to be at work before the bus ran. So, you know, they, they always made sure that she was safety aware. You know, don't be sitting out there by yourself. Don't talk to strangers. Don't get in the vehicle with nobody. You know, that kind of thing. Seems we cannot even allow our children to walk next door to the... I know. Exactly. Yeah, no, no. See, it wasn't. It wasn't. Ba back then, like, you know early 2000s that people didn't think anything about it people did not think anything about it if, if both parents had to be up and, and go to work early you know kids just got up and and did what they had to do they they knew their routine they knew their safety steps to take and you know the majority of uh, of the time you know people didn't even think about it back then It does, it does seem like that, doesn't it, Lexi? It does seem like the world was a much safer place back then. And I don't, I don't know if that's actually a fact, if it really was safer, or maybe we were just brought up to think that way. Because it seems like we're starting to see now a lot of these cold cases with a lot of these kids that went missing back then. Now to the second bus stop. Later that afternoon, Tabitha's mom returns home from work. And when I got home at 
she gets home at four and then she never come home on time. Nope. So I knew then something was wrong because she was always on time. She was never late. Almost immediately, he goes out to look for her daughter. I allowed her 10 minutes for the bus to be late. And then I went up there. She wasn't up there. And then there's kids up there that they didn't see her. Thank you. So I came back home. I drove up to the school and I banged on the door and banged on the door. One of the teachers gives her some alarming news. Tabitha wasn't on the bus that morning and she never made it to school. Nope. Trying not to panic, Deborah heads home and calls Tabitha's friends to see if she's at one of their houses. But no one has seen her all day. I got home at mm. probably 10 minutes to five. I was in a panic because, you know, I didn't know, didn't know what type of it was. I received a phone call about five o'clock, maybe. My mom asking what my sister had on uh, that morning. And I told her I didn't know because I didn't, I didn't see her. Why? And uh, she said, well, your sister never made it home. Well. We're calling the police. Hey, Deb, good to see you. At 6 p.m., a now frantic Deborah calls the police to report Tabitha missing. By the time the police were called, she had already been gone for eight or nine hours. Yeah. Uh, from her bus stop. Yeah, I mean that's and and that's been a big part of the problem too. The number of hours that she was missing before anybody even realized it. Because you gotta think back then. You know, like like the schools now, if your kid does not show up for school, if they're not there by the time that late bell rings at, say, 10 minutes after 8, the school is calling your house. They are calling your cell phone. Hey, your kid didn't show up for school. Is everything okay? They didn't do that back then. Back in 2003, they did not call the parents to notify you that your kid did not show up for school. They just assume that, hey, if they're not at school, then they'll come back tomorrow with a note, a doctor's note or something, some explanation, and everything is fine. But, you know, that eight plus hours lead time, whoever took her had that much time to get her away from the area. And I think, you know, and I, really, I think that's part of the reason why school started calling every morning when your kid doesn't show up to school is for reasons like this. And I don't know about anybody else out there, but it sometimes it annoys me. It frustrates me. And I'm like, yeah, I know my kid didn't go to school. I'm sitting right here looking at him. It's fine. But I get it. At the same time, I get it. Because if there ever was a situation where I thought my child was supposed to have went to school and then I get that phone call that says hey you know what he's not here then you know then you're going to appreciate them being attentive and and calling like that so I think you know just you know, a little side note I think sometimes we get annoyed at things that we probably should have a little bit more patience with but yeah yeah back then it was mom will call whenever yeah exactly Exactly. That's not, you know, that that's not the way it is anymore. When I was going to school, parents worked and you could miss school and nobody. Exactly. Exactly, Bamber. I mean, we used to do it all the time. We used to do it all the time. We, we, we used to skip school all the time and nobody ever figured it out because nobody called to say, hey, your kid's not here or, you know, why why did they not come to school today or anything? I mean, you you can't you, you can't do that anymore, and that that's a good thing though, it really is. Still get texts from school when my grandbabies live with their parents. Exactly, exactly. They 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 really they really worry about the kids now. The tutors tell police officers that they just found out Tabitha wasn't in school all day, and hasn't been seen since the morning. If she were abducted, that gives a suspect, you know, eight to ten hours head start. Yeah. We didn't know if we were looking for her in the Nashville area or she could have been anywhere in the country just about in the time frame. Exactly. That's a long time. Closed the day before, so I looked through her clothes to see if I could figure out what was missing. 
and I believe she had on a blue top with blue jeans and white sneakers. Investigators do an initial search of the Tudor's house. They went through some stuff, fingerprints. They took her hair brush, her toothbrush to do a DNA. I had told them that her money was still here and even her door key was still here. She didn't take her door key that morning because I was always here when she got home. Tabitha has left behind all of her clothes and makeup and $20 in cash exactly. with no clues as to her whereabouts. Early on, it was... You see, and that, that right there tells me that she was not planning on disappearing. If, if a child was going to plan on running away, they would have taken the little bit of money they had in their piggy bank. They would have taken, you know, those items that were special to them. Her, her little makeup pack that she had, her, her, her hairbrush, you know, clothes, her, her notebook, her little diary that she kept, all of those things. You know, I feel like, you know, she would have taken those things with her. She would have thrown all that stuff in her backpack and took it with her. She would not have left without her, you know, personal belongings. So, yeah, lady, look, I agree with that. Definitely not. It was, it was just unknown, you know, if she left the house. They just didn't know what happened. Due to the lack of evidence and Tabitha's age, investigators suspect that she may be a runaway, so they don't issue an Amber Alert. Yeah. For an Amber Alert to be listed, there needs to be some type of reasonable belief that a child has possibly been abducted or is in danger. There was a possibility, at least, that Tabitha had left of her own free will, and there was no information that she was seen with a dangerous individual or that she was abducted. But the tutors insist Tabitha would never have left home of her own yes. volition. Yes, she was 13. Yeah, Tabitha wasn't a rebe rebellious child. My parents, they were pretty laid back with us, yet they were strict. So we walked a straight line. Tabitha was afraid to get in trouble, I think. So I knew yeah. that she hadn't ran away or skipped school. No. I tried to explain to the police that she wasn't a runaway. You know, and see, that's, that's the thing about it is that they automatically assume, oh, she's 13 years old. You know, teenagers, they're in those moody, confrontational teen years, so she probably just ran away. She'll be back. You, you can't always assume that, though. You cannot always just make that assumption based on how old a child is. That, oh, well, yeah, they're at that age. No, that that's, every situation needs to be treated differently. I mean, if she's never had any issues at home before, she was not having issues at school, she was not having any kind of issues that would have said, hey, you know what, she just wants to walk away and, and, and get away for a while. There was no signs of that, no red flags for that anywhere. So for them to just automatically assume that she ran away makes no sense. To, and they still do it to this day. They just automatically assume, oh, well, they're 13, 14, 16. Yeah, well, they ran away. They'll be back. It's fine. No, it's not fine. That's one of the things I think they need to change. And I get it with the Amber Alerts is they have to have a vehicle description a suspect description, all of that. But there needed to be some type of endangered child alert, something issued. But for Tabitha, there was that was not issued. The only thing was issued was a local bolo alert for a missing child. That was it. They didn't push this out to the entire state. They didn't push it out to surrounding states until later on. That that should have been done from minute one. Whoever took her or whatever happened to her, they had eight to ten hours to get her away from there. In eight to ten hours, you could be in another state. So why not put that alert? I would rather them put an alert out and find out they didn't need it than to not do it and wish they had later on. I mean, that's that's something, like I said, has definitely got to change. I don't know exactly how to go about making that change, but 
we're definitely, I know I for one, am definitely going to keep screaming about it until somebody decides to listen because that's all I can do. I told them they didn't know my daughter like I do. Whether 13-year-old Tabitha is a runaway, lost, or missing, police know that time is of the essence. They execute well, yeah. a search along a five-mile radius, touching the nearby Cumberland River and Shelby Park. They did a pretty substantial search that night. Concerned people from the Tudor's neighborhood pitch in to help. They were all searching and everything with flashlights. And then the whole community came together when they found out about it and helped look for her. I mean, it was people I ain't even never seen before come out to look. And they searched yeah. and searched. I didn't go out and search for her. I was, I was really hysterical. I didn't want to go nowhere unless she came back home. Exactly. They wouldn't let you go out and search anyway. That's just the way it goes. Tabitha Danielle Tudors to do an in-depth search of her bedroom and discover an intriguing clue. There was a note with initials on it, indicating like it was someone maybe the Tabitha had a crush on. The note is in Tabitha's handwriting with the initials TDT N M T L. Tabitha's initials are TDT. Tabitha Danielle Tudors. But Tabitha's parents say they don't have any idea who MTL could be. Yeah, that was that that is definitely an interesting piece to this case. And as far as I have seen, they have not figured out who MTL is. They they still have no clue who those initials belong to. I mean, TDT, Tabitha Danielle Tudors, that's her. But the MTL, as far as I have seen, like I said, I don't know who that could be. Whether that's a friend of hers from school, they've not been able to figure that out, or somebody from the neighborhood. But also, I mean, in everything I have seen, Tabitha was not that child that, you know, hung out with the neighborhood. She's not one of those kids that would just go out and play in the streets with the other kids and, and, and things like that. You know, everything about her life was structured and centered around her family. If, if she was out playing, her family was there. Her sister was there. Her mother, somebody was with her. So for her to have a relationship of any sort with people that her family didn't know would be extremely out of the character, in my opinion. So who that MTL is, is a complete mystery. We have no clue who that might be. While detectives continue to dig, an unrelated tip surfaces involving a possible trip. eyewitness. To oh, that's possible. Never thought about that, Evan. There was a child that went to school with her. Um, he told police that he seen her get into a red car. The 11-year-old classmate of Tabitha's says that he was waiting at the second bus stop at 15th Street and Boscobel when he saw Tabitha walking toward him from 14th Street. Yeah. And then a car appeared next to her. He said the car came down Boscobel from 14th, headed toward 15th. He didn't give a very detailed description of the car, but he did say it was red. The boy tells police he got a good look at the driver of the vehicle. He yeah. said that it was a male black driving the car and that she got in the car and the car went back out the way it had come in. He said that Tabitha was in the car. He don't know if she got in on her own or if somebody pulled her in or threatened to make her get in. But he just said it was a dark skinned guy with a baseball hat. But the tutor said Tabitha would never willingly get into a stranger's car. I always told her, you know, yeah. don't ever get in a car with nobody. My best friend asked her to take asked to take her to school one day, 
she wouldn't do it. She said, my mama says no, and she wouldn't go. Based on the boy's account, investigators believe that Tabitha got into the car somewhere between the two bus stops on 14th and 15th about her movements. Yeah. They were given a article, I think some uh, stuffed animals of Tabitha's from Tabitha's house. And they went out the front door, they went to the right, went up the hill, and they crossed 14th at Bosco, and went down to the third or fourth house, made a circle and come back, and they stopped. Well, the dogs lose Tabitha's scent in the middle of the block between 14th and 15th Street. Yeah. It's the exact route that the boy described seeing Tabitha walk that morning. Before. So that, that to me would tell me that she did get into a vehicle. Whether it be willingly or, you know, what, how, however she was coerced into getting into a vehicle. That's where her trail stops. We know that she didn't just evaporate in the thin air. She had to have gotten in a vehicle. So I believe you know, at this point, I feel like they should have put out an Amber Alert right now. You know, just based off the, all right, they, they have, even though it is a vague description, at least it's something. Red vehicle, dark skinned male, baseball cap. It's a vague description, yes, but it would have been better than nothing. But at this point, they still have not issued an Amber Alert or any other type of alert. She is still just a local missing child that they are pretty much just keeping it in the local area. Before getting into the car. I believe based upon uh, the dog sense, uh, she went to the first bus stop and, and, and halfway down uh, is when she was picked up. Investigators look for the African-American male the boy described picking up Tabitha and the red car he was allegedly driving. I was trying to figure out who had a red car and I couldn't figure out if we knew anybody that had a red car. And we didn't know anybody that had one. In the meantime, police discovered that Tabitha's classmate wasn't the only one to have seen her that morning. Uh -oh. There's a woman that lives on the corner house she saw Tabitha walk into her bus stop the morning that she disappeared. There was a man who saw her at the intersection of 14th and Boscoville. There was another lady who drove through who was familiar with Tabitha, and she saw her in that same area. There were at least two of Tabitha's schoolmates who saw her crossing over 14th to Boscoville. Yeah. So there were at least four people that said they saw her. So they know for the a fact people that, that saw that, Tabitha route. that morning said she was holding something in her hand, looking at it, and we're assuming it was her report card. She's proud of her, 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 all her A's and B's, and I guess she was just looking over it again. Although the new eyewitness accounts give detectives a more precise timeline of when and where Tabitha was last seen, none of them reveal anything out of the ordinary. But within hours, Investigators have a breakthrough closer to home. They learn of a man familiar to the Tudor's family who matches the description of the driver of the red car. Investigators started kind of taking a look at Jamie's boyfriend at the time. My boyfriend at the time was a black gentleman. He lived with Jamie in the Tudor's home some months before Tabitha went missing. They just questioned him because of the dark colored skin with a ball hat. I mean, he wore ball hats. Detectives find that Jamie's boyfriend was aware of Tabitha's routine and where she got on the bus each morning. The investigators started trying to mm -hmm. determine where he was. So then Jamie's boyfriend tells police that he and Jamie weren't together at the time and he hadn't stayed at the Tudor's home for months. And they find no connection to a red car. In fact, Jamie's boyfriend didn't own a vehicle of his own. But was said to have sometimes driven Jamie's or driven different relatives' vehicles. There was really no direct link. He obviously knew Tabitha, and at one point they had a really good relationship. Jamie's boyfriend also has an alibi for that morning. A friend he'd been staying with confirms they'd been together the morning that Tabitha disappeared. He passes a polygraph, and investigators find no evidence linking him to Tabitha's disappearance. With Tabitha
No, that was their first dead end right there. Hey, Lisa, good to see you. I sped this up a little bit because this video is about 45 minutes long and we're only 17 minutes in. So, I mean, if it's too fast, just let me know and I can slow it down. But if it's okay, then we'll just keep playing it like it is. But yeah, that was that was their first lead and their first dead end. You know, they they thoroughly investigated him. He passed a polygraph. His alibi checked out. There was no connection to him whatsoever. But they're now missing for 48 hours. Investigators are once again on the hunt for a lead. They turn their attention back to the paper found in Tabitha's room, containing the initials MTL. Thank you, Ava. They canvass people in the neighborhood and in Tabitha's school, and soon find a potentially promising match to the initials. The 18-year-old son of a couple who were friends of the tutors. Uh-oh. But when police question him, the hopeful development quickly falls apart. The young man was in school the morning Tabitha went missing. There was no reason to believe he had acted through disappearance. Hmm. Investigators find no other evidence related to the note or the initials MDL. But within a few hours, a classmate of Tabitha's comes forward with new information. One of Tabitha's friends had indicated that at least on one Saturday, she and Tabitha had gone to the library in East Nashville. And they'd gotten on a computer and gotten on uh, apparently some chat lines or some chat rooms. Uh -oh. The young girl was able to take investigators to the library and show which computer they used. That I computer was taken that. and thoroughly examined forensically by our department. While detectives anxiously wait for the results, forensic investigators scour the computer, looking for evidence of Tabitha's chat history. Then, later that same day, a local woman comes forward with an unrelated and disturbing story that police hope could lead them straight to Tabitha. This lady went to Mrs. Tudors and said, you know, have the police look at this man because... He had my daughter. Mm. I forgot about that, the library computer thing. Two days after 13-year-old Tabitha Tears mysteriously went missing while walking to her school bus stop, police zero in on their most hopeful development yet. A Nashville mother with two young daughters has just come forward with a troubling story about a man named Paul Davis. She yep. says that seven years earlier, in 1996, he appeared to take an inappropriate interest in her 10-year-old child. Yep. She met this individual, speaking to her daughter. Not about that one, too. He would have been in his late 20s, I guess, maybe 28 years Nasty old. Nasty man. And inquired with her daughter, you know, why are you talking with this older man? And she said, oh, he's, his kids go here, or his nieces and nephews go here. You know, he's fine. Despite her daughter's lack of mm. concern, the woman tells police that she continued to have a bad feeling about Davis. Yep. One year later, in 1997, she says that the situation got worse when her older, 13-year-old daughter ran away from home. The mother's first thought was that Davis might have had something to do with it. When she realized that her daughter had left, she went up to her room and started searching through her things, and she found this individual's name written on several notes or love letters written to him. The woman's wow. daughter came back home two days later, but her mother was convinced that Davis had had inappropriate contact with her daughter. Mm. Police tracked Davis down and bring him in for questioning. They find that he has a history of spending time with underage girls, most of them around Tabitha's age and blonde. Six years earlier, in 1997, he was convicted of statutory rape and received five years probation. So he became a, a pretty big person of interest. Detectives find that when Tabitha went missing, Davis was living just three and a half hours away in Kentucky. They also discover that he had made a trip to Nashville around that same time. He comes to Nashville mm. earlier in April of 2003. He was seen at the market, the four-way market, which is only a half block from the Tudor's residence. Uh -oh. It just seems like it fit, um, considering his uh, back history and hanging around in our neighborhood, wanting to talk to young girls. But when investigators construct a complete timeline for Davis, they realize that he has an alibi for the 29th of April, 2003, the day Tabitha oh. went missing. And there goes he was eliminated the hip, hip. based upon his sister giving an alibi for him, saying that he was in Kentucky. Investigators have no evidence against Davis, so the once promising lead is dead. Over the next few weeks, Another dead nothing end. new develops. The Tudor's family suffers every day from the devastating loss of their little girl. I would go down to the river, and I would walk those river banks from one end to the other. Mm-hmm. 
just to see if she was down there. I said, I'm walking the river bank. I would drive around looking for her. Couldn't find her. It about drove me crazy. My dad cried a lot. They cried a lot together. So sad. We did have a lot of people step up and help out um, in the beginning. But after a while, some of our friends stopped coming around as much because they didn't know how to comfort us or what to say or, you know, it's just, right. it's a tough situation. So they choose just to stay away. Despite their suffering, the tutors do everything they can to get exposure for Tabitha's case. We tried to keep the media informed of, you know, everything with Tabitha. It's like right now, the neighborhood is changing off. Mm -hmm. But we found different uh, things to try and get her name out. So that was our first button. I think we made these ourselves. We just kind of popped them in there. Um, and then we figured out that we could yeah. order them for, from a company. Uh, so we had these made. Uh, the bracelets say... They did a lot of <clears throat> a lot of their own spreading awareness, a lot of their own campaigning. I mean, from the button pins to bracelets to flyers that they had made, T-shirts, banners. They they did a lot, you know, a, a lot to try to help and keep the word out for Tabitha, and they still do. Her 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 family is still trying to do everything they can to keep the word out. They are, they're definitely, you know, still coming, like I said, coming up on 20 years later, they're still doing everything that they possibly can to try to keep her, her face and her name out there. And there's just like, a, for the last two years, at least that I know, it's been at least two years since the last promising leads have came in. There, there's been nothing. There's nothing in two years. Pe people are not talking. So whoever did this is not. They're they're not going to come forward and tell on themselves. They're they're not going to you know say anything to anybody at this point. It is awful not knowing. It has to be. It has to be. I know that some of the family has tried to get her mother and father to move from that house they you know they want them to move closer to you know closer to other relatives closer to you know a better neighborhood and you no know, her her mother refuses she says no she said she said i am not leaving until tabitha is found because that is the only home that tabitha has ever known and she's scared that if tabitha were to come back and they did not live there anymore, she wouldn't know where to go. So, she, you know, she said until Tabitha comes home, she's not leaving. She's going to stay right there for as long as it takes. And I think that that is so sad. That That is the most saddest thing I can think of. Magnetic car signs, and they still have, yeah, exactly, they do. Yep, they still have that banner up on the front of their house that, that has Tabitha's picture on it, and that's not coming down until Tabitha comes home. No matter how long that takes, they, they're, they're not going to stop. Bring Tabitha home. I wanted people to look and, and see what, um, you know, what my shirt said. This one, still missing, uh, is what it yep. says on the bottom. To let everybody know that uh, she's still missing, and it says, "Help me find my sister." They're they're worn out. Like the picture on the picture on this one is is almost gone. I love that picture. Yeah. So sad. Over the next few months, numerous tips come in, claiming that Tabitha was spotted in different Nashville neighborhoods. Yeah. Please check out each and every one, but none of them go anywhere. Until September 12, 2003, five months after Tabitha vanished, when news comes in that suggests extremely disturbing circumstances in her disappearance. Mm. A man named Millard Earl Smith has just been arrested in Nashville and charged with rape. Uh, Millard Earl Smith. I heard that he uh, he lived on Fester's Lane, which is about four to do with Tabitha missing. He actually made the statement mm -hmm. that he is a predator. Oh, he definitely is.
On September 19, 2003, five months after 13-year-old Tabitha Tudors went missing, Nashville police arrest a man named Millard Earl Smith and charge him with the rape of a 17-year-old girl. Mm. The circumstances of the crime make detectives wonder if Smith could be like the way I think for being appearance. here. He was on his motorcycle and he came across a couple. It was raining. He offered him a ride. He told him that he would have to take them separately, obviously being on the motorcycle. He ended up taking the boyfriend in one place and took the girl to his trailer and raped her. Miller Earl Smith lived on Bessers Lane, which is about four miles from here. Although he doesn't match the description that Tabitha's classmate gave of the driver of the red car, Smith had been convicted of kidnapping, as well as solicitation of a minor in the past year. When Smith is brought in for questioning, detectives discover something that deepens their interest in him. He did not own a car, but we did find out that he was helping his brother-in-law some in East Nashville who worked on different cars, so he could have had access to a, a red car. While police dig into Smith's background and recent whereabouts, results come in from the forensic exam of the library computer that Tabitha used to chat online. They were able to determine that Tabitha's username had been used on the computer, but they weren't able to find anything to determine what rooms and what she had done on the computer. Wow. There have just been so many people that have used it since that that it kind of covered up the data. If there's any evidence on the computer that could help police find Tabitha, it appears to be lost forever. In the meantime, Miller Smith denies any involvement in Tabitha's disappearance. He says he was on a camping trip with family at the time. Though his alibi is never confirmed by police, Smith passes a polygraph test, and investigators can find no evidence linking him to Tabitha. Yeah. But he remains a person of interest. He was investigated thoroughly, interviewed, polygraphed, and he really cannot be completely eliminated as a person of interest. For the Tudor's family, as time passes, the lack of answers becomes more and more of an emotional drain. Some um, were like, oh, this is it. Like, this is the lead. This is what's going to bring her back home. Um, and then others, it's like... Uh, so many times they had leads. They had these, you know, the like we were seeing here, the the different people that they've looked into. And I and I remember that too. So many times they would come out and be like, "Okay, well, we got a lead, you know, going in this direction." And you're like, "Yes, they're right there. That this has got to be the piece that's going to put this together. They're going to find her. They're going to find out what happened." And then it's just like, "Uh, nope." dead end, hit a brick wall, have to go back to the table, regroup, and try something different. But I, I could not imagine having to go through this roller coaster for 20 years that, that this family has been through. 20 years of, okay, we got leads, we're going in this direction, getting your hopes up, thinking, okay, this is going to be it any day now. That piece of information that solves this is going to come in. We're going to know what happened to Tabby. And then it's just the rug pulled out from under you over and over again. I, I cannot imagine what they're going through as a family and, and what they continue to go through. I just wish, you know, that there's got to be people out there that have the information they need to make this you know, make sense to, to, to figure this out. You can't tell me that 20 years has passed and the person who did this has not ever once slipped up and said something to somebody. Never once have they said something that made people look at them and go, hmm, why are you talking about this? Or, or, or you know what I'm saying? I, anything? There, there's got to be something. Somebody has to know that piece of information. Whoever did this could not possibly hold on to this secret for 20 years. I just, I don't believe that. There's got to be more than one person out there that knows what happened to Tabitha and where she is at. And you would think that now, at this point, whatever alliances and whatever bonds they have with people would be so, you know, changed and broken to the point where somebody would be willing to come forward and say, hey, you know, so-and-so was talking to me back, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, and they said this, maybe you should, you know, something. It, there, there, there's got to be something. It can't, it, it can't just be that Tabitha just vanished into thin air and nobody knows and 
and nobody's going to be held accountable. Like it just it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> Let's see. I, I wonder about that too. You know, it, whoever did this, if they've gotten away with it for this long, you know, what was it a a one time and and done kind of thing, or have they went on to move to other neighborhoods? other places and continue to do these things. I just, I, I don't know. Do you think it was two people that abducted her? I, honestly, at this point, I don't know. I mean, if you go off of the description that the other kid that was at the bus stop, the description he gave was one vehicle, one man. I mean, if you're if you're going off that, then it was probably just one person. I mean, typically when 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 you know you're dealing with crimes, the more people you involve, the more risky it is somebody's going to talk. So it's it's entirely possible that that just one person did this. One person, for whatever reason, was driving through that neighborhood, saw her, and decided, "Hey, today's the day. I'm going to snatch a child." And for whatever reason. And unfortunately, she happened to be the one walking by herself. I mean, that's that that's entirely possible. You know, I mean, they because they have ran down every lead they could think of as to people connected to the family. And and they have found nothing. What are they even talking about? It has been an emotional roller coaster since day one. Months pass. And the first anniversary of Tabitha's disappearance comes and goes. The Nashville Police Investigations Unit still works tirelessly, exploring every tip that comes in. I have a 13-year-old at home, and I couldn't imagine her disappearing and me not having any idea what had happened to her. Exactly. I feel like the burden is on me to try to get answers for the tutors. Tabitha's had several different detectives on her case. I can't tell you the, the, the number of detectives. Um, and now currently we have Detective Jolly. We feel that... Detective Jolly is going to be the man to solve this case. Three more years pass, and the investigation goes cold again. Again. Leaving the Tudor's family living in an excruciating state of limbo. I can drive in my car. You know, I can hear her singing. And every day for like, I don't know how long, when I get in my car, she was with me. I could hear her. I could see her. She'd be sitting there like she's real. And she'll be singing to me. When I get to laughing, I, I know people probably thought I was crazy going down the road laughing. Because she made me laugh all the time. In 2008, on the fifth anniversary of her disappearance, police asked local newspapers to print a story about Tabitha to put her case back in the public eye. Yep. The strategy works. In June, an unexpected tip comes in that contradicts eyewitness reports that police have been working with for years. Yeah. The wife's niece said that she had an employee that said Tabitha did not get into a red car that morning. She had got into a green car. Green car. Five years after Tabitha Tudors went missing, Nashville news outlets publish a plea for new information. And a brand new tip comes in directly to the Tudors family. Niece opened up a tattoo shop, and uh, this guy came in there. He was riding his bike, and he stated that Tabitha did in fact get into a green car that morning. He said mm -hmm. it was parked at the bus stop of 15th and Boscoville. It's unknown why the witness waited so long to come forward, but this detail takes the case in a whole new direction. Investigators saturate social media with the new tip. Detective Jolly immediately picks up on any tips and runs with them. But in the days and weeks that follow, no new information comes in. Nor are police able to track down a vehicle matching the witness's description. Mm. It's another devastating blow to Tabitha's family. I mean, it would be really helpful if we could get more than just red car, green car. If we could get a make, model of this car, you know, something, any, any distinctive characteristics of this vehicle, even if they don't know exactly the make and model. You know, just something more than just saying green car, red car. 
you know, I mean, de details are important, but unfortunately, like, we don't have those. We don't have those. We have, like, vague descriptions. And it's, it, it is, it, it is so sad. I hope this doesn't turn into a life, uh, exactly, Lady Luck. That's, that's what I hope to. I mean, that's, that, that's what I hope to. I mean, I never thought we would be coming up on 20 years. 20 years, I cannot imagine. She left that house, a 13-year-old child, and right now she would be, you know, going on 33, 34 years old. I cannot, I could not imagine that much time passing and them being no closer really than they are, they were at day one. Yeah, on same. See, the, and and that's the thing is is back in the you know got to remember this was in two thousand three, two thousand three. They didn't have traffic cameras. They didn't have, you know, neighborhoods didn't have security cameras on their homes, doorbell cameras, all of the things that we have now. We 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 did not have any of that. Uh, no, nah, Lady Luck, we didn't. We didn't have any of that. I don't remember as far as I back as I can remember the earliest I can remember traffic cameras becoming a thing was mm, trying to remember here. I believe it was around maybe 2010, 2010, 2012, somewhere around in there that, that I first remember them talking about putting traffic cameras in cities in Tennessee. Yeah, and you got to think too. Unfortunately, Tennessee is a lot further behind other states. Usually, we are the last state to get new technology on anything because we go by the motto of if it, of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We don't like things to change. We don't like things to upgrade. We are we are very you know set in our old ways. We we like things to stay the same and simple. Keep it simple. That's the, that's what we like around here. And and sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes it's a bad thing. I blame myself. You know, if it wasn't for my kids and my grandkids and my mom, hey, good to I see you. What I would have done. My grandkids is really what kept me going. The investigation goes stone cold. Eight years pass with no new developments. Eight oh, more years. a lot with me. And at night when we go to bed. Oh, yeah. I imagine. We would talk about her every night. And everything before we go to sleep. And then hmm. we talk about her every day. Then, on February 10th, 2016, 13 years after Tabitha's disappearance, the long silence breaks when detectives finally get a lead about the green car. A local woman tells police... She just realized she knew someone who owned a car fitting that description back in 2003. Uh -oh. A young lady contact man said that she knew of a Hispanic male that lived within just a few blocks of the Tudors that lived in a duplex uh, and drove a green car. Uh -oh. The man's name is Juan. And police recognize that over the years, this isn't the first time that name has come up in the investigation. Tabitha knew mm. a man by the name of Juan that was 19 at the time she disappeared, that lived down the street from her, and that she would sometimes go down there while... Bo was taking a nap in the afternoon, and that uh, I hope you feel better, Lisa. Smoked cigarettes with him. So when this uh -oh. particular tip about Juan came in, it caught my attention. And police also learned that Juan was well aware of Tabitha's disappearance. A woman said that her daughter was married to a man. His name was Juan, and he had gotten emotional and told his friend that he worked with that he he owned a car like that, and he was afraid that they were going to be looking for him. And supposedly made comments about it wasn't supposed to happen that way. Detectives find mm. that Juan now lives huge and interrogated and polygraphed extensively. Detectives confirm that Juan used to drive a green car owned by a friend, but the vehicle is no longer in his possession. So many years later, wow. investigators have no luck finding it. Juan takes and passes a polygraph test. He maintains his innocence at Tabitha's disappearance and says nothing that detectives find incriminating. For whatever reason, this woman had really embellished and given information that was not at all accurate. We were able to eliminate wow. Juan in Louisville, Kentucky. It had no connection to Tabitha whatsoever. 
today. And see that 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 just shows you that even even back then, even back twenty years ago, people were still doing the same thing they do now. For whatever reason, inserting themselves into cases, you know, calling in false information, embellishing, adding to the story, if you will, for their own personal reasons, whether it be they did maybe maybe she just didn't really like this Juan carrot guy. Maybe she had a personal issue with him and was just trying to throw him under the bus for something and and hoping that it stuck or just, you know, to inconvenience him and make his life a little bit more difficult, she just put him in the spotlight as a suspect to abducting this 13-year-old child that he had nothing to do with. It is. It is, Lady Luck. It is very frustrating that people do that. They've been doing that for as long as I've been following crime. They, 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 there are people that, for whatever personal reasons, will insert themselves into cases or they will insert other people into cases just for inconvenience and think nothing of the fact that they are taking time out when these detectives could have been running down some real legitimate leads, possibly, or could have been out there re-canvassing neighborhoods or whatever they needed to be doing. But no, they had to take their time out to go all the way to Louisville, Kentucky, hunt this guy down, polygraph him, interview him, and go through all of this trouble just to find out the woman was BSing and he had nothing to do with it. I don't know. At some point, people that call in false information should be held accountable for that. There, there, there needs to be some way of holding them accountable for doing stuff like that. I don't know exactly what crime you could charge them with i don't know false information well i guess it wouldn't technically be false information if he did have access to a green car you know it could have been partly believable but i don't know is is, is being a nuisance to a case is, is that a crime maybe something like that 15 years after she disappeared detective stephen jolly is still actively investigating tabitha's case they are following leads, going back to the very beginning, looking at everything, trying to pick up on anything that they may have uh, missed. This case is probably on my mind more than most of my other ones. But there's just so much to it, and there's so many different avenues and different leads yeah. that it often, often comes to mind. It's been very challenging, but I really wish that I could be the one that could help them get the answers. Exactly, that they're looking for. Lexi. I hope and pray. The two are this, still doing everything they can. This year's going to be the year. Case in the public eye. I think about my sister every day. You still have hope that they'll find her? Yes, sir. Absolutely. It didn't take very long to answer that question. No, we've never lost hope. Nope, they haven't. They have not given up ever, and they won't. We'll get her back one day. We have talked about moving, and that was one reason why we haven't moved yet. Yep. Because where we live at is the only place that she knows where home is. Mm-hmm. Tabitha's family says they feel as strongly today as they did when she disappeared, that she didn't leave home on her own. No. I believe that day that Tabitha came up missing, somebody took her. I don't know if it's somebody that she knew or somebody that she didn't know, but they took her. I know my child didn't run away. No. It's heartbreaking on all of us. I know she, she didn't, didn't either. Uh, didn't get to see her graduate. There's see her, uh, no way. Get her driver's license. And, you know, just a whole bunch of she see them. I said, but wonder. You know, she's 27. Would she have kids? Would she be married? And what would her kids look like? And definitely uh, a lot and of she's things. She's 33 head, now. Um, after all these years. This is the older video. We have a room just about the same way it was when she left. And I, I hope that one day that she'll, she'll come back home and see her room just like it was when she left. It's hard losing your child, especially when you don't know where they are. I just want some kind of closure. That's all I need. That's... Age progression software suggests what Tabitha Tudors would look like today at age 28. If you have any information on Tabitha Tudors or her disappearance, 
please contact Nashville Crime Stoppers at 615-742-7463. Now, this is the latest update. There's somebody out there who knows something, but they don't want to come up and say. And this year might be one of them that knows something. The subpoenas stem from an incident out of state where an individual under arrest told police he knew something about the disappearance of Tabitha Tudors. He later tried to change his story. But now he and his girlfriend will answer questions before a federal grand jury, this under threat of perjury, if they lie. Yep. Now this is, like I said, in August of 2020, they had tips come in that Tabitha was possibly abducted, pushed into drug use and prostitution that, that, that she was, you know, trafficked in the, in that manner. And there was also a story that came out that allegedly at some point she was held on a property in Hickman County. So they did get an indictment, a search warrant to go out and search that property in Hickman County but as far as I know, they did not find anything on that property that would have belonged to Tabitha that would have pointed toward her ever being on that property. Now, I mean, does that mean that that story was made up and it wasn't real? I don't think so. I mean, because you got to think. 17 years had passed. From 2003, when she went missing, to this hap this information coming in in August of 2020, 17 years. A lot of things can change with property in 17 years. If there was anything that belonged to her out there, clothing, shoes, socks, anything, it would have been long gone and deteriorated within that length of time. I mean, it would be like looking for a needle in a haystack at that point. So is it possible that she could have been on that property at some point? Especially if they're saying that they feel that she is still alive. Then there may not be any evidence that was left behind. So I don't think they can 100% rule it out and say, no, she'd never been there. They just know that they did not, they, they dug up the property and, and they did not find human remains. She's not deceased on that property or anything of that sort. I think that's that's a lot of where the hope comes from that she is still alive. Uh, yes, Vicky. Her yes, the parents are still alive. They're still alive. They still live in the same house they lived in whenever she went missing. They're still right there in their East Nashville home, waiting for her to come come back to them. There were a lot of tips that came in regarding the possibility that she was abducted and that she somehow got hooked on involved in drugs and that she was forced into prostitution. A particular individual that we're looking at as a potential suspect heard that he made comments that, uh, in regard to having something to do with her either abduction or murder. Mm. There's probably more human trafficking cases now than there were when Tabitha to disappear. The police department wants them to know that we're willing to do whatever it takes and we're not going to rest until um, we, we find her. Yeah. Obviously, my hope is that she's still alive and we've seen no evidence. We've not, not been given anything directly uh, suggesting that she's not a lot alive. And I want the public to keep on being reminded so they know that she's still out there somewhere and she needs to come home where she belongs. I miss her. We all miss her. In my heart, I believe she's still here. That poster lets everybody know that she's still missing. We know it's a 50-50 yep. chance that she may not be with us anymore, but in my heart, she is. I just want people to know that she's still missing. She All is. we need is that much right there. That people don't understand. You know, I'm saying that much. You know, that's that's all we need. Because there's somebody out there oh, somewhere that knows something, they're not telling anyone. If I leave and she does come home, she won't know where we're at. So I, I can't leave. Nope. I mean, 
I sit here and look at all these big old houses, but I'll be here for when my baby comes home. This is the only place she knows to come to, is here. So, I'll be here. I hope that they find out something about that little girl, because she's been missing for so long. Hoping for her safe return home. Yep. That's, that's what keeps us going. I think about my sister every day. You still have hope that they'll find her? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Didn't take very long to answer that question. No, <laughs> we've never lost hope. Nope. It's been very challenging, but I really wish that I could be the one that could help them get the answers that they're looking for. And it is like she's just vanished off the face of the earth. It's like one morning she's here and then the next minute she's gone. We've always had hope and we're, you know, we're not ever going to lose that hope that we're going to get her back because we are. You we're going to get her back. Can't give up. Our grandchildren that's been born after Tabitha come up missing. You show her, show them a picture of who is this. That's my Aunt Tabitha. Somebody picked her up. Unfortunately, you know, it's another Mother's Day that my wife has to be here without her or other daughter. It won't get any easier until uh, we find out what has happened to her or if she's done past or whatever. Then it then it it might not get easier, but then at least we'll know where she's at. Yet. Tabitha's had several different detectives on her case. I can't tell you the the, the number of detectives. Um, and now currently we have detectives. Anytime now we can get that call, we've got her. She's coming home. What a relief that would be. That we're gonna find her. I'm find her. I have to. Exactly, she three PO. Just gotta keep praying. Gotta keep her face and her name out there. Somebody knows where she's at. Somebody knows what happened to her. cannot believe that it's 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 coming up on 20 years and all of these leads have been dead ends and it's just you know i mean 2020 was the last big push that i've seen to find answers for tabitha and i don't know like i don't know i don't know at this point if if there i mean I would assume the case is still open and the, and they're still working it if leads come in, but that that's the thing. As the longer it goes without leads coming in, the more people are going to forget. If we do not keep the faces of these missing kids out there in the spotlight, people are going to forget. And we cannot let any of these kids, not Tabitha, not Summer Wells, not any of them, be forgotten. We, we can't let them be swept under the rug.
we have to keep pushing for answers and holding somebody accountable. It is, Lisa, 20 years. I cannot imagine the hurt her family goes through every year knowing that another year has passed, another Christmas, another birthday without without Tabitha there, without knowing. I mean, lo- losing a child is one thing. You You lose a child if your child passes away due to illness, due to whatever, accident, anything like that. You hurt, you grieve, but you know where they're at. Tabitha, they don't know. They don't know where she's at. They they don't know if, I mean, the hope is that she's still out there. But if she's out there, where is she? Where is she? What has she went through for all of these years? What what has she endured? Who has she been with? Where is she at? I mean, that's... That's the question that, that, that everybody wants answers to. And here is the age progressed photos. They they do these every few years. And the last one they have done was for Tabitha, which what she would have looked like at 32 years old would have been last year. There, I don't know if they're gonna do a new one for this year or not. Like I said, I mean, they, they do them. It seems to be like every four or five years, they do an age progressed photo. So we may not get a new photo for this year. But I wouldn't imagine that she would look much different than she does right here at her at her third age 32 photo. But definitely, you know, keep keep Tabitha in your thoughts and prayers, guys, and, and her family as well. And. You know, we, we have to do what we can do to, to keep her name and her information out there until somebody decides to give up that piece of information. That it's just one one piece of information is all it's going to take to bring her home. And we can't give up on that. I thank you guys for being here. Thank you for all your love and your support over here on this channel. And I will catch you all on the next